welcome everybody to the library. If this is your first time, please afterwards take a little walk around. This is National Library Week. Um, this is the middle of the week. This is just part of our slew of events. So today we're doing a pop culture panel. Uh, we're talking about story lore, the art of narrative and popular culture. Does anybody know who this guy is? I do not. Oh, you guys are killing me. <laughs> so uh, this is from The Never Ending Story. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, is, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. see it. So, um, so my name is Joe Colbert. I'm a librarian here. And I'm going to kind of be, uh, well, mostly these four folks are going to give you their take on a particular pop culture topic. I'm just going to go. I'm going to go down and give you just like the brief explanation of who everyone is if you don't know. Uh, this is Wesley Whitfield, Associate Professor of Chemistry. Um, Wesley's also an artist and musician. And I should say that coming up next Friday, uh, you guys know about TEDx? Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. I'm on the committee. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wouldn't correct you. But JK. <laughs> Thursday. So Thursday night uh, at 6 p.m. in the Fine Arts Theater, Wesley and a couple other folks are going to be giving TED Talks to you. So Wesley's doing That's that. That's next week? Next yeah, week. next yep. week, 19th. 19. Come, 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 it's going to be awesome. Yep. Uh, and then you have Tim Beam, professor of English. Um, it's also on Popcorn Dudes, right? That's right. And probably the reason that a great many of you are here today. <laughs> Not uh, extra credit. Yeah. Uh, you have Chris Otto, associate professor of English. Um, Chris is interested in, I know, I know she do a lot of like First Peoples, Osage, Mm -hmm. Cahokian kind of, it's kind of like, that's sort of what he's going to be talking about today. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you have uh, Lisa Pavia Hegel. Did I say your last name? Yes, right? you did. Awesome. Hey. <laughs> Associate Professor of Communications in Theater. Uh, Lisa's an organizer, performer, writer, I will say entrepreneur. I think that's an actual. Sometimes. Uh, and so you can find her writing on uh, superheroines, etc. right? So um, we're going to start with Wesley, and then everyone's just going to kind of give you a particular pop culture microcosm, and we're going to. You just go down, and at the end, we're going to try to tie it all up in a bow for you. So I'll hand it over to Wesley now. He's going to talk about Black Mirror. How many of you have seen Black Mirror? Anybody watch Black Mirror? A couple? Okay. It's pretty, pretty wicked. It's on uh, <laughs> Netflix. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to start with a quote. Um, if you can see the slide over there. Oh, sorry. I have to move it myself here. Okay. So I'm, I'm titling this Black Hermeneutics. You should take a look, up, look up the word hermeneutics. It's a just fancy word for interpretation. And of course, black is coming from Black Mirror. So uh, I've watched every single episode several times, not all of them every single time, several times, but most of them. And I wanna start with a quote from Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, famous philosopher. The emptiness of being can never be filled up by the fullness of beings, especially when we don't experience it for what it is. The only way to escape this emptiness is to endlessly order and arrange beings so as to guarantee incessant, aimless activity. And I find that pretty interesting because uh, it was written way before this show, of course, came out. <laughs> uh, Heidegger was also dealing with a lot of technological change back in the time, so there's also a lot of technology in his philosophy, which Black Mirror is fundamentally about. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the narrative of Heidegger's philosophy as I see it as it moves through every episode of this online series. Okay, so there is a word in German called Dasein, and it means being. And uh, Heidegger is going to talk in his philosophy the majority of the time about being. And uh, he has a quote here. I think you can read it up there. It says, Dasein is the entity which in its being has this very being as an issue. Welcome to philosophy. It's very strange. <laughs> uh, so one thing that's important is there are a way of looking at being in the world is if you want to think about what being and what I mean by that throughout this little talk here is just think of being in the world okay with objects with other people with yourself with your environment and engaging with it of course and if you've seen Black Mirror Black Mirror is basically all about this yeah there's a quote here I wrote um, I said the quote so uh, I want to talk about two forms of being one is a capitalized letter B and what is a lowercase letter B? And he really distinguishes between these two terms. The one is saying it's a permanent reality uh, within being, which we call existence. So he's going to talk about existence. Existentialism, he went into this phenomenology. And he says that's, but more specifically, it's existence which endures and remains. Okay, that's capital B, being. Uh, then there's also lowercase b, being, which is the appearance, the concrete forms of existence. So I am going to basically say 
throughout this, set, uh, this talk here, is that Black Mirror is, I think, is showing us, in through every single narrative, the being, capital B, versus the lowercase being. I think it's a struggle that Black Mirror really encapsulates. And of course, uh, as you can see here, uh, I'm trying to show you, sorry, I'm keeping up with this one's a little difficult. Can you see that okay? No. Yeah, I can't read it. Yeah. yeah. My bad. I made it so it's like a black mirror, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see, how about, okay, that one says technology, right? Technology and being. He's written quite a few essays on techn technology and being. His first work was uh, Being and Time, uh, Sein und Zeit. So you can take a look at that if you want. But this one, I'm more interested in the technology aspect. So there's a technology in being, the capital B, right? We said that's the permanent reality of existence. And then there's the technology and lowercase being, which is the appearance, the concrete forms of existing. So I think this is a theme in Black Mirror. All the episodes, in my opinion, and I've seen all of them, uh, all have this theme regarding each of these in conflict with each other, as I mentioned previously. So what I want to do here is I'm going to go through several. I'm going to I pick five of my favorites. I could have picked more, but these are my favorites. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is called 15 Million Credits. This is, I don't know if you guys recognize that actor. Get Out. Good movie. Okay. So uh, I'm, going to say, I'm just going to say some quotes for each of these episodes that Heidegger has is attributed to Heidegger. Okay, here's, one I, here's the quotes I attribute to this episode that when beings are abandoned by being, they lose their density, their power of resistance, their very thingness, and fall prey to objectification, exploitation, and manipulation. When being withdraws from the world, the world becomes an unworld, no longer hospitable to human habitation. If you watch this episode, I think you'll find that to ring quite true. It's a really intense episode. I'm not going to talk in depth about what happens in them because I'd like you to go experience that yourself. They're really, really good. They're fun. Okay, next one. This one's a really creepy one. They're all creepy, by the way. Uh, this is um, Be Right Back. Here's a quote that I attribute this from Heidegger. And I'm just going to reread it because I've already uh, said it. I'm going to reread it again because this, this episode, in my opinion, really encapsulates this. The emptiness of being can never be filled up by the fullness of beings, especially when we don't experience it for what it is. The only way to escape this emptiness is to endlessly order and arrange beings so as to guarantee incessant, aimless activity. If you watch this episode, it really rings true in this too. So I wanna, I'm gonna pause a little bit and say that what I'm trying to get you to see so far is there's a technological aspect. And the being, as you relate to it, how do you identify yourself? What does it mean to interact with the technology? I'm trying to say that this is the narrative that runs through the Black Mirror episodes. And I've picked a couple. So I've got two down. Let me go through a couple more here. This was called Nosedive. Try again. You can pass it down. Okay, there we go. This one's insane. <laughs> because we all, we all have cell phones, right? We all know what social media is, right? Tell them briefly, just really quick, what the episode is kind of sort of Okay. Because so, this is one I think they'll really get. Can you see where it says Lacey 4.2? Okay, so throughout this uh, episode, you see Lacey um, interacting with everybody you know, around her, workers, co-workers, and, uh, and, her, and her brother who lives with her. And this is a world in which everybody takes their cell phone, and when you interact, you swipe to give them an interaction points if you think it's a good interaction, or you swipe down if you don't think it was a good interaction. In fact, there's a quote in here where, some, where this actually happens. She interacts with a guy, and he does not, he takes points away from her score, and I think he says it wasn't a meaningful encounter. <laughs> That's all he says in response. So it is, it's like, it's like getting likes on Facebook, right? It makes you feel good when you do, and if you don't get one, you're like, oh, what happened? <laughs> this is a rating system, so the rating system is actually affects how you can buy things, where you can live in your social status. There's an inner circle that's better, 4.6 and above. And actually, just so you guys know, this is, I think, in, happening in China currently, or, I could, I, or I, it was I, tried? We were talking about it. Yeah, I, I think it was. I think it's happening in the United States. It's well, capitalism. Exactly, <laughs> right. Well, this is a credit-based system, which is really creepy because it's on this individual level. By the way, each of the slides will have a picture of the beginning and how great they look and how the technological and how it's affect their being. 
So every third image on the far right is always going to be more of like, oops, fall from grace. <laughs> so each one has shown that. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see them all on their phones. <laughs> that looks like us, right? <laughs> Well, okay, sorry, so I'll read, the, I'll read the quote here. This is from 1969 not I, that I attribute to this. We presume to control, direct, and regulate our technologies, but in fact, human beings do not control the inner drive that compels us to amass more and more technical capability and to inframe, right, giving score, all beings in an ever-expanding network of circulation and consumption. So that's Nosedive. I highly recommend this one. It's actually pretty fun, but also depressing. They're all very depressing. <laughs> <They're> all depressing. <laughs> this one's my favorite. This is absolutely incredible episode playtest. Cooper is amazing. His acting is incredible in this one. Wouldn't you agree, Tim? Oh, yeah. It's fabulous. All right, here's my quote for this one. We will never experience our relationship to the essence of technology so long as we merely represent and pursue the technological. So long as we remain within a certain attitude toward technology where we are comparing pieces of technology against each other, where we are playing with it, where we are using it, where we are becoming more and more obsessed with it, where we are reading reports about it, where we troubleshoot it. We are not actually engaging with the essence of technology if we only put up with it or we evade it. So what happens in this episode, it's really a beautiful episode. Cooper is a beautiful human being. He's traveled the world having a blast. And I will describe this one in depth because it's really incredible. And uh, we don't know much about him except that he's just great. Everybody who interacts with him just loves this guy. He's wonderful. He's traveled everywhere. He ends up in England, no money all of a sudden. And he meets this gal and she tells him about a way to make money, which is to go and volunteer yourself to undergo a play test where you try out a game that's being getting ready to be sold. It's a virtual reality game, and as you can see, he's got this little thing all around his head. Well, they actually had to put something in the back of his head, too. <laughs> and he, you know, he agrees to it, he signs everything away. Well, you can see at the very bottom, looks pretty scared. What happens is the thing, there's a glitch, and it basically erases all of his memory, which is really weird because you find out throughout the episode that he's actually trying to escape the fact that somebody in his family has Alzheimer's and doesn't know how to deal with it. So that quote that I read earlier, this is, this is one of the things where you just have a tough time and that, that, that way of being with others is also tough. So he, he tries to escape and then technology really, really causes him to escape even more. It's insanely good. It's a really good episode. All right, the next one is Archangel, which is complete insanity. Here's the quote that I have for this. Everything is functioning. By the way, these are all Heidegger quotes, just wanted to reiterate. <laughs> everything is functioning. That is precisely what is terrifying. That everything functions. That the functioning propels everything more and more toward further functioning. And that technicity increasingly dislodges man and uproots him from the earth. All our relationships have become merely technical ones. It is no longer upon the earth, an earth that man lives today. And this episode is about control. And uh, it's about control that a, a parent might have, so in case you lose your child. And Archangel is a device, you can see her holding it. It's a screen that monitors, she's got an implant, they're implanting the child. And it monitors heart rate, it, you can see everything they see, and if you don't like what they see, you can actually filter it, like censor it. Like, you know, you might not go, be able to go to certain websites. Well, if there's, a, there's a scene where a dog's barking, and that's going to be considered to be harmful to the child. You can't hear it. You can't see it. If you cut your finger, you can't see the blood comes out. She can, the parent can control everything. But the parent can also watch everything that, the, that their daughter, her daughter's doing. So I don't know if you can see that last slide. Can you see that last slide very well? What do you think's happening there, <laughs> if, you, if you can see it? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a future. It's, it's, you watch her grow up into an adolescent, and, uh, and she is... They, the parent promised not to use Archangel after a while, but she decides to get it back out and use it, which is a total invasion of privacy, right, for an adult like that. That's her bashing her mom in with the Archangel platform. <laughs> it is a violent ending, but again, it comes back to this unleashing and, un, and, and a disconnection, even though the technology was supposed to connect you. <laughs> so uh, that's a really interesting uh, episode, I think. 
How much time do I have? You're at 12.04. Uh, you're out. Okay, <laughs> let me just say, I think that's my last one. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Perfect timing. <laughs> Hand me the clicker. Clicker. Here you go. <laughs> okay. Ready, Tecumseh, a legend for all time. So um, I'm going to talk about a specific type of story, which is a legend. And so we wait for this. So a legend, if you look at the etymology of the word, and those of you who are in my Comp 2 class know that I love to do that, but a legend uh, originally meant something like the story of the life of a saint. Right? And so, um, from medieval Latin, the word meant something to be read on certain days in church. If you look at the Encyclopedia of Folklore and Literature, it says, a conversational narrative whose reported events are set in historical time and whose telling makes possible debate concerning real world occurrence. In other words, a legend is sort of told to mean that this is what really happened in the past. Right, the legend of Sleepy Hollow, right? It's supposed to um, verify some actual event or some person. Another way to think about a, a legend is, and I like this, I thought of this today, it's a rumor that has graduated into kind of being fact. People <laughs> accept it as kind of being a fact. Right? And so we can split hairs about how that's different from myth, and, and, but we won't. <laughs> so uh, who was Tecumseh? First of all, um, if you see on the right-hand side, all of those congratulatory lauding phrases that are right there, an uncommon genius, an Indian Bonaparte, an Indian King Arthur, this is a lot of praise for an enemy because he fought against the United States. Um, the romantic noble warrior. Um, in, my, in my discussion, I want to talk a little bit about a cluster of legends that surround Tecumseh and also a little bit, which is probably too ambitious, to kind of trace a little bit of the arc of the uh, legendary figure of Tecumseh and, and how he factors into um, our world kind of today. So a couple things about Tecumseh. Tecumseh was a Shawnee. He was originally born in Ohio. So think 1768 is the time of his birth. And the legend begins with his birth. According to his mother, you know, which I don't know how anybody knew this, the day that he was born, his mother saw a comet, <laughs> right, in the starry night. So think of other legendary figures whose births are associated with stars, right? He's destined for great things. He is born in Ohio, and he is... Uh, trying to, he's born into a world of violence and war. It's after the uh, American Revolution and the Shawnee are fighting for their way of life. Um, he, along with his brother, um, kind of developed this idea. It's not new to them. Other Indians had tried it. Pontiac, the Ottawa Indian. He wanted to establish in the Ohio Territory an Indian state. And so there's three really important principles that if you're taking notes, Madison, you need to know this about Tecumseh's philosophy. Number one, he wanted to say there would be no individual ownership of land. Oh my God, he was a communist, right? This is gonna, we're going to own land in common. We're going to have Indian land, which means that if you're an Indian from another tribe and you make a treaty with somebody, you can't tell me I can't live here anymore because you don't speak on behalf of me. The great... Spirit gave us all the land to be owned in, in communal ownership. Number two, central to, to Tecumseh's um, philosophy. You have to reject white ideology. You have to reject white technology. You can't drink. You can't wear white clothes. You can't do white things. You have to rediscover your Native American heritage and farm the way that your ancestors did and dress in skins and hunt in the traditional ways and honor the rituals. And the third thing the third pillar of his philosophy is Indian unity. So he wants to transcend this idea of tribalism, right? We're kind of taught that what keeps Indians apart is that they're so tribally oriented that they could never get along with the Cherokee or the Creek or the Sioux or whoever. But Tecumseh's um, speeches make it clear that he's arguing for something that transcends tribalism, a pan-Indian resistance kind of like uh, you know, Tecumseh the Federalist, right? So there's a cluster of fables about Tecumseh the Federalist. 
there's a cluster of fables about, or I'm sorry, legends about Tecumseh as kind of predicting these strange events in um, uh, geographic uh, history. And then we'll see how he's been kind of remembered and still remembered today. Hopefully I won't be out of time. <laughs> okay, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. He, these are two engravings from uh, the, around the time that this took place. Does anybody know, uh, well, Tippy Canoe was the battle where William Henry Harrison came and attacked the Shawnee village. And he used this military victory to ride a wave of popularity all the way into the White House. <laughs> William Henry Harrison and his, his uh, campaign slogan was Tippy to Canoe, right, which is the village that they destroyed the Shawnee and he, um, uh, and Tyler too, which was his running mate, John <laughs> Tyler. Well, what happened to Harrison? <laughs> he died 30 days into his presidency because he gave a four hour inauguration speech without his coat on and he got pneumonia and he died. And so, that gave birth to, skip that slide, <laughs> a curse. Have you ever heard of the curse of Tecumseh or the curse of Tippecanoe? No, you haven't. Well, look at all those <laughs> dead presidents up there. So the, the, the idea goes is that, okay, so William Henry Harrison, elected in 1840, died in 1841 in office. Abraham Lincoln died in 1865, right? James Garfield, assassinated. William McKinley, assassinated. Warren G. Harding, died. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, died. So somebody looked at that and said, you know what? I bet Tecumseh put a curse on the presidents because all these presidents seem to die uh, as a result of this uh, battle. Well, of course. Only the ones in, with O's, right? Only the ones in Every 20 hundreds, years, every 20 yeah, years. Only, yeah. So Ronald Reagan upset the balance. He was supposed to die when he got, uh, you know, but he didn't. And then uh, 2000, uh, George Bush almost died on choking on that pretzel. But he, <laughs> so we would have had it. Okay, um, another, so there's a political aspect. And we could look at, there's several politicians who, who really rode the uh, fame that they garnered from their interactions with Tecumseh all to high office. There's more than, than just that. Um, one of the legendary aspects, uh, another, this is sort of the supernatural stuff, Tecumseh supposedly traveled all the way to Canada and then all the way down to Florida on this long epic journey walking hundreds of miles every day to spread the word of his pan-Indian confederacy that he was trying to form in Ohio. Well, what happened is he was actually, we know pretty certainly that he was in Alabama or Louisiana, they weren't states yet, talking to the Creeks in 1811, right, December of 1811, January of 1812. And what happened? There were these great series of powerful earthquakes, the Numagrid earthquakes, that were centered right around there. So the legend has it that he's talking to the Creeks. And half of the creek, the creeks had already divided. They're bifurcated. There's the young warriors want to go to war and, and fight. And the old ones are like, no, 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 let's not do this. Let's just go with Americans. <laughs> and so Tecumseh's down there and he's speaking to them. And uh, half of the tribe says, yeah, that sounds good. The other half says, no, we're not really down with joining your union. We don't want to fight. We don't want to get involved. And so Tecumseh supposedly says, Hey, you old people, I'm going to show you that I mean business. I'm going to leave here. I'm going to go to Detroit. And when I get there, I'm going to stamp my foot on the ground three times. And I'm going to holler at the top of my lungs. And you're going to feel the ground shake. And then he left. And then the earthquakes happened. And those people were, and that, so the legend has it that that event really split the creek in half, which led to the Creek Civil War, which gave rise to Andrew Jackson, you know, Indian removal. He goes down there and puts down that civil war. And then he becomes president um, as well. There's also no great legendary figure escapes having star-crossed love affairs. <laughs> There's a legend that says Tecumseh met this woman, Rebecca Galloway, in Ohio. And in 1934, an ancestor of hers actually wrote a book and said, Rebecca Galloway and Tecumseh were an item. <laughs> Even though he was an Indian and didn't speak English and she didn't speak Shawnee, but supposedly <laughs> he hung out with her and she taught him English. She read him Shakespeare and they fell in love. It's a beautiful idea, isn't it? <laughs> and she said, Let's, you know, he said, let's get married, and you know, she said, I will only marry you, Tecumseh, if you abandon your Indian ways. 
and if you live in a cabin and wear clothes and become a Christian. And of course he says, alas, I cannot do that, right? And so then it's the classic love story that just, just couldn't happen. <laughs> that, uh, those two images are taken from, the top is a frieze on the inside of the Capitol Rotunda. You can't probably make it out, but it's a depiction of Tecumseh's death at the Battle of the Thames in the War of 1812. He fought with the British. Nobody really knows who killed him or how he died, but some white people found a dead body and they thought that it was Tecumseh and they decided, we're gonna say this is Tecumseh. And they did all manner of horrible things. They cut flesh off of his arms and they used it as razor straps. There was a cottage industry of Tecumseh icons. This was the shotgun or this was the rifle that Tecumseh actually had at the Battle of the Thames. These are the clothes that the Tecumseh was wearing actually at the Battle of the Thames. When um, William Henry Harrison announced his presidential campaign, he did it at the Battle of Tippecanoe and they had the clothes that supposedly Tecumseh wore on the day that he actually died. So that's memorialized there. The bottom is a one-ton slab of white marble that sits in the Smithsonian Institute of, of uh, uh, American Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum depicting the dying Tecumseh. Now, if there's not a more romanticized image, look at that. For all of you art historians, he's in a classical, you know, almost like a Romanesque yeah. pose. This could be the death of Hector, or this could be the death of some other mythic figure. But the question I want you to think about is, what do these legends sort of serve? Why do we remember this person in this way? What is he doing there? So it's not just Americans who've really made hay with Tecumseh. The East Germans, the communists, they wrote, a, they had a Serbian actor uh, play him, and I've never seen the movie, but I just found it. But <laughs> supposedly the movie really picks up on the communal ownership of land aspect, and they want to kind of co-opt this Tecumseh image and sort of make the case that, look, communism is natural, right? It's, it's <laughs> unnatural to be the other way. What did I just do? Okay. Okay. I got it. Okay, the other thing that I will say while he's fixing that is that the Nazis got in on it too. In the 1930s, Fritz Steuben wrote an eight-book cycle of uh, novels based on Tecumseh, and they were, picking, they were making this kind of crude allegory that Tecumseh was like Hitler, or Hitler was like Tecumseh, that just like Tecumseh was trying to forge this um, Indian unity that the Germanic people needed this uh, <laughs> strong leader to pull them together. Hmm. Orson Scott Card, there's a Red, uh, Red Prophet series. There's also a spin-off comic book where they have a Tecumseh-like figure. The wooden Indian in Cheers was named Tecumseh, <laughs> and if that's not evidence that you've been completely absorbed <laughs> into the popular culture psyche, I don't know what is. Tecumseh recent sightings, there's a book, uh, there's a movie on TNT, Tecumseh the Last Great Warrior. Those other two books were written within the last uh, year or two, and we continue to be fascinated um, with this uh, particular character. So in conclusion, I just want you to think about um, how legends obscure history, even though they're told in ways that make you think that this is supposed to be true, and they probably say more about us than they really do about the figures. The last thing that I would say is that as I was kind of preparing this, I couldn't stop thinking about, you know how hunters hang the heads of their, their trophies on the wall? That there's something about that that kind of resonates with the Tecumseh art. It's sort of like, look at how powerful. He was great, but we conquered him. <laughs> so we're even better. <laughs> and so I want you to uh, think about how leg uh, you know, legend sort of um, exists in your life and what it's obscuring as opposed to maybe what it's revealing. Thank you. Was that close to the time? <laughs> I think the clicker. Is that over? No, a, little over. Bit. a little bit. <laughs> a little bit? Not at all. <laughs> Five minutes? No, it's 1340 if you really want that. I do want to. I know. Damn it. Here, let me. Just, you gotta keep talking about Tecumseh. Tecumseh, Tecumseh. It's a curse. It's great. Uh, great. Uh, maybe Joe should. Maybe you can't be trusted. I didn't prepare cl this thing doing clicks. Come on. Okay, when you're ready. So, uh, the story of the night told over narratology in the OA. <laughs> I guess there's going to be even fewer people who have seen this. How many people have seen the OA? Okay, nobody. I can say whatever I want. You don't want to know anything better. <laughs> anyway, it is a Netflix show, so this. 
panel was in part sponsored by Netflix, apparently. Uh, and the, the, we got a quote from Shakespeare here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, it allows me to plug the, the Midsummer Night's Dream, which is being uh, uh, acted on Saturday, 6 o'clock, Fine Arts Theater. Again, some of my students get some more extra credit going to that. But the, the quote basically means that uh, these, these lovers who've come out of the forest, they've told these crazy stories, and Hippolyta's basically saying, yeah, okay, it sounds crazy, but it all seems to add up to something substantial. And that kind of sums up a little bit about, yes, crazy stories in the OA, but there, there is something perhaps substantial at the heart of it. Uh, the, there is a storyteller also who tells stories at night, and her name is Prairie, or the OA. You can do the next uh, slide there. She uh, disappeared seven years ago, as a, and she was blind when she disappeared, but in the present day, she's back, uh, out of, you know, returns from captivity, and she can see again. So that's one slightly supernatural element that the show introduces like within the first five minutes. In my way uh, into trying to come up with a theory to analyze this show, I, I thought about narratology. And there is a book called Narratology by Mika Ball. It's Narratology, Introduction to the Theory of Narrative. It's very complicated, but I've tried to extract a few terms that I thought could apply to the OA. Uh, one term that, that Ball uses and other people who study narratology use is this term fabula. And Ball defines it as a series of logically and chronologically related events that are caused or experienced by actors. And by actors here, she doesn't mean like stage actors, theater actors. She's talking about people who simply take action in the story. Uh, Ball also points out that there are you know, the different kinds of fabulas that occur, the different kinds of you know, chronology of events, and she says that uh, some fabulas are driven by lies and some fabulas are driven by secrets. We, it's possible that in the OA there's both lies and secrets combined. We'll analyze that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, the, the main character is Prairie. And she, but when she returns, she does not go by the name Prairie anymore. She says, I'm called the OA now. <laughs> and I, I, more people should have asked, what does that stand for? Because uh, you really don't learn until like six or, sep yes. six or sep seven episodes in that it means the original angel. I figured the original part, like original gangsta, I just couldn't figure out the, <laughs> the A part. And uh, I should have because there was tons of hints that it was you know, the original angel. But she just kind of casually throws it into dinner conversation. I'm the original angel. Uh, so, uh, her story, though, is, uh, and the weird thing about, again, she claims to have been kidnapped. Uh, but she won't tell her story to the FBI, she won't tell her story to her own parents. She will only tell it to these five strangers. She comes to know them and so they, they're more than strangers after a while, but they, they, uh, they gather at nighttime and she tells them like a little part of the story each time. Personally, I would be like, okay, I've got my Red Bull here. Let's just stay here the whole day. Let's finish the story. I don't want to come back next night. <laughs> you left a cliffhanger the night before. But So this act of storytelling is at the heart of what's going on in this. And you do, the, the stories are so crazy that she tells that you have to ask as a reader, okay, I mean, as a viewer, do we, is this true? Is she making this stuff up? Uh, one of the more fabulous elements of her story is that she t claims to have met a being called Katoon. And, oh, no, sorry, I skipped over the, no, let's go back to the other one. Uh, yeah, she, this is the guy who kidnapped her. Uh, uh, again, she claims his name is Hunter, Oh, I wish, <laughs> sorry, Hunter, Hunter Percy, yeah, yeah. Percy. Hunter Percy, goes by Hap, he's got like different names too, and, but she, later she refers to him as the angel hunter, so yes, she believes she's an angel, she, there are other people with her in captivity, uh, and she believes they're angels as well, now, Hunter's uh, particular uh, interest in why does he kidnap people, well, he's doing experiments on people who've had NDEs. It means near-death experience. You might have heard of it before. And he thinks he can learn something about the afterlife or the other side or some other dimension through killing these people and bringing them back to life over and over and over again. So a very sadistic guy. And when, in a couple of the NDEs Prairie has or OA has, she meets this figure called Katoon. Very strange, just, she's blue, she's purple. Uh, so, she's you know, surrounded by stars and whatnot. So we really don't know who 
who is this? And in fact, she never says, my name is Katoon. <laughs> Later, it's just like, yeah, so Katoon told me this. And I would have stopped her there and said, wait a minute. <laughs> what is, who is this again? But she meets this, this figure a couple of times when she has her NDEs. In fact, it's Katoon who apparently, she was born with sight. And Katoon takes away her sight and says, uh, I can't bear for you to see what's going to happen <laughs> or whatever. So it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. Uh, and the whole reason she claims that she's telling this story to these, uh, she, she wants these people to know her story, these strangers in the present day, but she also claims that as you know, an angel, uh, she has some kind of special knowledge that she's gotten from Katoon and uh, that they can perform. She and the other angels in captivity have learned certain movements that you can do and that give you certain powers. What are the movements? Well, they involve either yoga, yeah, stuff like this, or <laughs> weird mo movements and all. It's yoga, interpretive dance, whatever you want to call it. So uh, it's it's very strange. And uh, again, at this point, as a, as an audience member, I'd be like, really? That's how you get the magical powers. But uh, uh, the other thing, so she's teaching these people these movements in the present, think you know, claiming that we're going to open up a portal and we're going to be able to you know rescue the people that are in captivity. She also says that there's some kind of evil on the horizon. So you can, some of the stuff, it sounds like something like maybe a charlatan might use just vague hints of some evil in the future. And they do finally come to doubt her. They, they're given some evidence. They think that she's just been lying to them the whole time. Uh, but a great evil does finally appear. Uh, there is a, a, oh, and I forgot to mention one other guy. Uh, this is Homer. This is one, this is the one she, who's still in captivity and she, uh, she falls in love with them, sort of, and so she's, I mean, she wants to rescue the other people, too, but Homer's the one she wants to, to rescue the most. Uh, and I don't really have a slide of the, I'll, I'm sorry I'm giving spoiler, I'm spoiling the whole show for you, but the great evil that finally appears is a, is a school shooter in a, in a cafeteria. And even though, the, the, and these kids who she's all, she's been telling the story to, they all go to this this high school, uh, one of the teachers who listens to her story, she, she teaches at the high school. So when this shooter, school shooter appears, they're all like, this is it. <laughs> this is our moment. We got to do the movements, you know. We got, she told us some great evil was coming, and here it is. So they just stand up in front of the school shooter and start doing these weird <laughs> movements. And the beautiful thing is nothing, no white lights appear, no magic happens. So we could go, hey, she was, she was throwing them with a But the, the guy's distracted, and somebody tackles him while they're doing that. So, yeah, it's slightly comical as to how it all goes down. Uh, but the sad part of it is that... Uh, and the always not even there at the time, but she has some vision at home that, oh, the great evil's happening now, I, gotta, I know where to go. So she rushes to the high school, and the guy's tackled, and his gun does go off, and the only person hurt in this whole thing is her. The bullet like, goes out of, outside the building, goes through a window, and, and hits her. So I, I like what one critic said. The, uh, she said, uh, Sophie Gilbert said, whether you find the scene incredibly moving or utterly ridiculous <laughs> will depend on your tolerance for interpretive dance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I got to admit, I think it looks especially ridiculous to Western audiences, but I think there's, it's evoking dance moves from other cultures and whatnot that I didn't have time to fully research. Uh, and there's an FBI shrink, maybe. There's doubts as whether this guy's a real FBI agent, but mm. he, his claim is that even if she was not telling you the truth, she was, she was basically uh, going, coping with a trauma. So some see, see the show as just a metaphor for somebody who's been through a trauma and through storytelling, she's, she's trying to cope with that. She's sharing her burden with others through this, through this story. Uh, unfortunately, the show really does play up the idea that it's like choose your own adventure. <laughs> uh, either she was, she was delusional or she was lying. Uh, and, you know, you just, there's nothing supernatural, really. Or is it just that you can't see the supernatural? And is she dying at the end of the episode? Or is she going to some other dimension to go rescue Homer? Uh, the final slide is just her, again, back to the whole storytelling idea and her uh, gathering them. To, and, and so this just reminds me of sort of other shows that I've liked that have a big puzzle to be explored, like X-Files lost and there is that question of uh, uh you know, evan nasis another critic uh, says uh, you know <laughs> the philosophical weightlessness of the show will either annoy you or pull you in i mean mm -hmm. i was pulled in with x files i eventually became annoyed by lost because i felt like these people do not know what they're doing they, don't, <laughs> they have not figured out their story uh but uh i feel like it's 
it's one of those things where you again you just either go with it or you, you just go, nope. Um, I think Lisa said, I'm out after half an episode. Yeah. Wesley watched it with me. He was not a fan. But uh, I like this, this credit. final way to sum this show up. Uh, this guy who actually likes the show, Evan Nassi, says, uh, the OA is BS, but it's beautiful BS. So anyway, that's all I got. <laughs> Well, I could have named my, I could have also named my, my uh, thing uh, Beautiful BS, that's totally possible. Um, there's also a movie coming out, or it is out, called I Hunt Giants, and it is an, another movie based on this idea that this girl is either the only one who can see these giants, or she's absolutely, uh, absolutely bananas. Mm, yeah. And so, and it's supposed to be just gorgeous, and it's kind of a superhero film, but it's an indie it film. So, I'm going to be talking, so I am the, uh, I'm the... I am a communications professor. My background and training is in media analysis. And when we look at media, we usually look at it in th two or three different uh, contexts. Contact one is obviously the story, which is kind of what uh, my wonderful colleagues have been talking about today. We also look at how something looks, the style. And then we look at the context. Where is it and, and how does it interact with everything else around it? And there is a theory called the symbolic interaction theory which basically says that there are certain things within media products that, to, to completely summarize it very quickly, scratch an itch. That there are things that satisfy us. And often there are things that are repeated over and over and over again. There are things that we see, um, sometimes you call them tropes. I think if you don't like it, you call it a trope, and if you do like it, you call it a homage. Um, but the, the, the line between a homage and a clone and a ripoff are very, very thin, and it often has to do with another theory called use and gratifications, which is what you are expecting to get out of something is what you end up getting. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about science fiction and how science fiction tends to reference itself, and if that is necessarily a good thing or maybe something that we need to take a closer look at. So my audience participation section for the afternoon. Can anybody give me a film example? So if, if you could, is there anybody here who can think of a film that matches this description? Gritty, dark, science fiction, asks questions about humanity, cyberpunk, so it involves computers. Blade Runner. Blade Runner, anybody else? Ready Player One. Ready Player One, maybe? <laughs> okay, so these are, this is not something, uh, not something completely un, um, unthought of or something that isn't familiar. And in this case, you're right, by the way, I was referring primarily to Blade Runner. Blade Runner is a 1982 film by Ridley Scott based on the book by Philip K. Dick, um, of Do, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And it was considered the, probably the biggest and most important film that established this genre that took cyber science fiction technology and squished it together with something called film noir. Um, anybody familiar with the term film noir? Okay, really super quick um, explanatory comma. Film noir is uh, generally considered between 1944 and 1954, <laughs> though there are additional outshoots. Has to do often with, and it's kind of hard to see, but you see the chick smoking? <laughs> do you see how the light's kind of coming through and kind of putting all these cool shadows into the shot? So this deep, contrast between light and dark is a really big film noir thing. For some reason it rains in every film noir movie. Like it's always, it's a very humid genre. And um, <laughs> it's almost always the hard boiled detective story. So you've got somebody in a trench coat with the, with the collar popped up going, I don't lock anybody. And that's basically film noir. Um, there's always a, some sort of mystery to be solved. And usually there's somebody called a femme fatale or a lady of death who is going to tempt our hero into doing something unspeakable and is going to end up leading to his downfall. Well, if you smoosh that with science fiction, that's cyberpunk noir. And that's kind of what Blade Runner was all about. Um, and it, but it was also dealing with some other themes, um, specifically in this case, what it is to be human. In the world of Blade Runner, there are things called replicants, which are basically robot android type things with realistic memories and a limited lifespan. So much so that they would get scared toward the end of their lifespan and they would run and then you would have somebody who would catch them. And that's a very young, very baby Harrison Ford in the corner and he was a Blade Runner and he would go get these people. And it, it really asked a lot of questions about humanity. 
And there's also a whole lot of imagery that's very, very common. There's an eye, reoccurring eye theme and all kinds of other stuff. So I'm talking totally about Blade Runner today, right? Nope. I'm actually, also, I'm actually here to talk about Altered Carbon, which is a show from 2018, it's from this year. And it is what many people consider a Blade Runner clone. And of course, you've got every, every critic everywhere having a lot of fun with the word replicant um, and clone and copy. And the critics really came out against the show saying, this is basically just a ripoff of Blade Runner. It's also questioning about humanity. In this case, when you're one year old, you get a doodad because so much of these stories are about doodads. <laughs> um, you get a piece of technology in the back of your neck, which is called your stack, and it records everything that there is about you, who you are, your memories, your emotions, everything. And if your body or your sleeve dies, they put you in another one. It's really quite, I would hope that mine would be about 20 pounds thinner. Um, <laughs> but you basically have your sleeve, and then if you die, they pop you in another one. Now, unfortunately, if you do this too often, you go insane. Um, and so there is still a limited lifespan if you're poor. And if you're also poor, you get whatever's on offer. So if the only available body is a 75-year-old man named Earl, who was a smoker, guess who you're gonna be for the next 20, 30 years? Your Earl. <laughs> now, if you're wealthy, very wealthy, you can afford to have clones of yourself grown. And those clones are perpetual, they're designer. They can emit certain pheromones. They can be the age you want. They can be the size you want. They can be the hair color you want. And they will grow you. And you will never go insane and you will never die. They call these people Mets for Methuselah, which are the, you know, a, the biblical character who lived for centuries. And if you are a meth, you likely live in some place called the Arium, which is a, um, a castle in the sky. It's all white, the people wear togas. It's very, <laughs> it's very <laughs> mythology. Like if you've read anything about Mount Olympus, that with more nudity. <laughs> uh, and so that's kind of the world of altered carbon is this idea that the haves are you know, able to be, live forever and amass massive amounts of wealth. And the have nots are going to be lucky if they can pay their sleeve mortgage. They also live in containers. They live in reused, recycled containers. It's like the entire human race is a giant hermit crab. Um, and this was, and, and it was very much pulling from cyberpunk noir and from film noir. You can actually see several of these. I tried to pull shots that were similar. It's kind of hard to see here, but a lot of the stylistic things are very, very close to Blade Runner. Um, Everett Burrell, visual effects supervisor, said that they knew they would be compared and took inspiration for the genre, but definitely wanted to make sure that they had something new and entire, uh, an entirely new thing. Laida Caligarius are, is actually one of the uh, show's creators, and she said, this is a show about a murder wrapped in a noir covered with a space epic. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and you can kind of see along the bottom, there's also a whole huge reference to Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, they live in a hotel called The Raven, which is employed by a sentient AI who wants to be their friend. And um, his last words in the whole show are actually the lines of Annabelle Lee. I figured my English <laughs> colleagues would, would dig that. And also pulls very much from the Wachowski siblings, the Matrix, and um, a lot of other references. Um, and honestly, if you look at this, it's kind of, it feels like a hodgepodge, but references are a part of all of our films. You know, we have, if you look at the top, that's actually a side-by-side -side of Kill Bill and Game of Death. Um, Stranger Things and Stand By Me, um, The Matrix, which is a mod podge of a lot of different things, and of course, Ready Player One, which is basically nothing but references. <laughs> so references can scratch that itch for us. It can be so useful to us, but it can also maybe go, go wrong. There was actually a really fun review. Um, Netflix's shiny big budget sci-fi genre grab, which is so badly wants to be Blade Runner, Audiences will be forgiven if they confuse the series for a buggy early model replicant still in the beta phase. <laughs> so there still was some definite things. And a lot of people did say that because they were being so focused on making a homage, so focused on making this feel like Blade Runner, that they missed so much opportunity to tell this really new and interesting story about what it is to exist. If there is no death, then what happens to life? 
And that's a story, that's a question that's asked that's so incredibly cool and evocative, but yet we're so busy trying to show this hard-boiled dude having <laughs> lots of fight scenes mm -hmm. that we miss these really great and amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. A lot of the critics felt like it was all style, no substance, you know, if I can get this to do with them. Um, oh, also one thing is that a lot of the critics who hated the show never made it past episode three. So I just wanted to make that point. That <laughs> it, gets they, it gets better. And this is very typically Netflix. They're like, hey, we got time. You're going to sit here. You're not going to do any work. You're just going to sit there. <laughs> so we have time, you know? Um, and I, I'm trying to, oh, you got to be it. faithful to time. I'm, why am I pointing at your head? <laughs> I'll change it with my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And there are <laughs> other issues and implications within the show. I'm not going to hit on all of these. I'm going to hit on whitewashing and gender, just because real quick. Um, one of the problems is that our main character, Takeshi Kovach, is a half Slav, half Japanese person. And when he wakes up, into our story, he's sleeved into a very white man. And at first, they do a pretty decent job in this initial reveal because he looks into the mirror and he sees his old self looking back at him. And the showrunner actually said, no, 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 this isn't a problem because we told his backstory in several other episodes. But they didn't, re but really at the end, he is protecting the skin for somebody else. And that's a long story, I'm trying not to spoil it to you. But his body, his white skin becomes very, very valuable. And that a lot of people in the age of Ghost in the Shell and the age of a lot of this stuff where we're trying to get more different voices on the screen feels very, very inauthentic to us. Um, additionally, in the world of really kick-ass female characters, um, we've got one who is this really great hard-boiled cop who ends up being a love interest. And then you've got this really great strong sister who ends up doing something that if I tell you would spoil the show. And a lot of times when nudity is used, and it's Netflix, so it's used a lot, <laughs> um, when the men are naked, it's like, ha ha, I'm naked. And when the women are naked, it's usually, yeah, I know, that's a thing I just said in an academic talk. <laughs> you know I mean? um, but when the women are naked, they're often broken, beaten, victims. Um, sometimes they're just toys. Sometimes they're naked toys with no consciousness, just sitting there waiting to be messed with. And so even though in the name of being very progressive, it still really isn't. Now, to its credit, because I know I'm trying to get, a, I'm going to start talking very Italian, very quick, really quick here. Um, <laughs> To its credit, it's very multi-ethnic, it's intergenerational. There's a great scene where they put a grandmother into this old biker and he comes to dinner for Dia de los Muertos and it's one of the best things I think I've ever seen and has a lot of commentary about what is identity because it can be put in any sleeve you like. So there's all these wonderful, amazing opportunities that I just felt like they glossed over in fame of let's see another naked fight scene. <laughs> so that's just, and there's all kinds of cool things that go on. I urge you to watch the show and get past episode three. Um, there's some beautiful things. One of my favorite quotes in there that I will leave you with is, mortality saved us from the darker angels of our nature. And that AI in this show are completely autonomous and they go, look, if you want to be free, you need to get away from serving humans and start serving up humans. And basically, they tempt us with all of our terrible desires. Hmm. So there's a lot of really amazing things going on the show. Here's the thing. If you missed Altered Carbon, don't worry. We have three more carbon copies coming out this year. One of them is actually called Replicas. Um, <laughs> and it is about replicants. And unfortunately, because of blockbuster syndrome, you will see more carbon copies. Mm -hmm. 37 of the last 50 blockbusters were remakes, sequels, or franchise films. Mm -hmm. And if we keep telling these same symbols to each other, then we don't necessarily get to hear the really amazing new stories that are under the surface. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna skip around a little bit because we're running out of time. Let's see. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so let's start with this question, and this can be for really any of you. So um, science fiction kind of has a history of uh, maybe sort of being like a fable or having like this underlying message that it's trying to push, particularly Philip K. Dick, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you were talking about all of these possible narratives that are underneath, um, but do you guys have a sense that the popular culture um, surrounding science fiction right now, like that there's some kind of zeitgeist in science fiction? Do you guys think there is? Do you think there's mm -hmm. something, there's something that, that science fiction in some is trying to tell us? I the AI thing is certainly mm -hmm. 
coming up a lot. And, yeah, like uh, be careful. Yeah, be yeah. careful. <laughs> and I mean, in real life, they're We've like, yeah. be careful. Uh, you got Stephen Hawking or whoever warning us that yeah. you know, they're they're gonna look at us as like nothing someday. They're gonna be like so more AI is gonna be so more. But we're creating things that are gonna like. Well, see I mean, us but Kurzweil is also saying that technology will free us from limitations and yeah. let yes. us become yeah. part of the similarity. It seems like there's yeah. a real 2045 tension between those two things. If either technology is gonna save us or it's gonna kill us. There's a there's a techno utopian. Mm -hmm. impetus, and then there's like a fatalistic kind of... Well, thinking about what, and I need to just point across, quick, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> back, um, is in, in Black Mirror, the idea of technology really being a foil and being something that can really bring us down. There's another version, there's a show called The Orville, which is definitely not a serious show, it's right. a fun comedy, but where their whole justice system is upvotes and downvotes. Mm -hmm. And I think I see a lot of stuff of technology and the mob mentality that I think yeah. I'm seeing a lot of that coming out of our science fiction writers, yeah. but yeah. anybody else? I think I think I think I see a lot about like what I would agree with Heidegger, and he even said this back when technology wasn't awesome like we think it is today, but back then it was. He says that human comportment is affected, as well as the human making meaning of technology. Like what do we what do we do with this? So that I back to the being idea, are we just playing with the essence of technology? What, are we, what is the essence of technology? What is the essence of being? Or do we just ignore it now? Or is it just all about not being? Because we have technology. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? Like, are we forgetting the being? <laughs> that sounds kind of like a, a Plato thing. Where yes. you have, like, the platonic, the ideal the form, and then you have, like, what all of us kind of sad mortals can accomplish, right? And so maybe technology, like if you think about something like The Matrix or even mm -hmm. Ready Player One, where yeah. everyone's going into this simulacrum, right? To escape how crappy the real world is. <laughs> I mean, do you guys feel like that happens? <laughs> I don't know. A little bit. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I think so. A little well, bit. and I mean, like, there's some great cross things going on with stuff like reference and, and the, the idea that technology is enabling nostalgia, which I think is really fascinating. Because, like, when I was a kid, if you wanted to go back and watch The Smurfs, you couldn't. So you just remembered, gosh, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now Netflix lets you go, oh, no, no, she was really bad. Yeah, don't watch yeah. Yeah. Don't go back and watch He-Man, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But so in a way, it's like kind of this commodification of our past, and it's really mm -hmm. making us and kind of grinding our development down because technology allows us to access our past. So we're going to hit the button of the thing that made us feel good all the time, i.e. 27 Star Wars films and not maybe necessarily moving forward. And that stagnation, now don't get me wrong, I love me a good Star Wars film, but it, it feels stagnant. It feels like we're pulling from this well of the past and we're not moving forward with really cool, innovative technologies. In Ultra Carbon, the idea of it, this, these, myth, these myths are so old that, that their kids are perpetually kids. Their kids could be 200 years old, but they're still in this kid role. It's not letting us move forward because we're so focused on looking backward. And I see that in quite a few of the properties that and I'm so watching that, now. That kind of leads into another question, which is, do you guys feel like because you have so many of these big expanded universes and you have these sort of like art constellations created by committee, so you have like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and things like that, do you feel like it's impossible for that to be good art? Like, do you feel like if you're creating a narrative based on like an algorithm or a committee who gets together and decides mm. what's gonna sell the best, does that undermine like the whole purpose of narrative, which could be, you know, um, like codifying legend, it could be creating mythology, it could be all these other things that are kind of more typically human endeavors. I have the pro Marvel stance if anyone's yeah. anti Marvel stance. I mean I, I like a lot of the Marvel movies. Lately I've been uh, becoming a little bored with them or whatnot. But I mean if if I say I really I mean I really like the first Avengers, that was there was some al algorithmic uh, right. <laughs> effects there. Apparently Marvel really tries to control what directors and write like so there is there, there's not some individual vision like Joss Whedon didn't go this is totally my vision and nobody else messes with how I make the Avengers right. and they still to me made a great movie there uh, Black Panther's another you know, great example I think but yeah. uh, I don't know what you see from well there. and and the reason I the reason I wanted to kind of go there and I know that we're not just talking about Marvel but one of the things that using gratification <coughs> talks about is that art can serve a lot of purposes and if you want something to make you feel joyful and jubilant and have a good time and laugh, that can still be art. It's still creating an emotional reaction in you and it's still giving you and serving you a purpose. Um, and I have, exactly. Um, and I have, uh, I actually had a friend who was a writer for Marvel 
And um, one of the things that he would do is he would bring his story to this group, and he would, they would say, oh, well, you know, you can't take Scarlet, uh, you can't take Black Widow to Moscow, because right now Moscow is covered in ice in this other story. But they had these people who were seeing this overall thing of you could enjoy this one story, but if you look at all the properties, you get this really cool, rich narrative with all these interlocking pieces. And the only way to get that was collaboratively. So I think that, yes, there is some commodification and commercial, commercialization that happens. It also allows companies to take risks, which I think is kind of nice. They can blow, you know, $10 million in a movie they don't think is going to sell and still, like, they took a chance on Black Panther. That's they, they were going to take a chance on it. They also took a chance on Inception. Mm -hmm. You know, um, shoot, help me, director. Inception. Uh, Christopher Nolan. Oh, Nolan. Christopher yeah. Nolan made, you know, $11 billion with them for Batman. He's <laughs> like, hey, I've got this thing where people, people dream in mirrors. And he's like, cool, man. Will you make more Batman? <laughs> sure. Here's $11 million. Go have a nice day. Wow. So that's in a way that that's <laughs> kind of, yeah, the, basically they said, if you'll make more Batman, <laughs> you can make your crazy dream project. <laughs> and so sometimes that can be used. By certain people for a good artistic effect. But it would be nice if there was more opportunities too for things like movies like Logan yep. or yes. uh, you know Deadpool. Of course, broke through. I don't know. Again, all the class. I know with Logan, the director uh, basically said that I want this to be R-rated so that it doesn't have to be something that ties in with Burger King lunch meals or anything <laughs> like that. I, I'm not worried about the cursing and all that. I just want to tell a story for adults. Yeah, and, uh, right. which, yeah. Which, which I think brings us to this, this question. I, and I think um, this made me think of, of your uh, talk, Chris. So when you're talking about anti-heroes, right? Mm -hmm. like, like, uh, like Logan or Deadpool, or even maybe even Tecumseh. I mean, like, you could certainly see it that way if you're talking about, like you said, like this is a, this is a trophy that right, America right, has right. created. I mean, do you, do you think anti-heroes uh, create more compelling narratives? Well, personally, I do, because I am, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I don't really like the superhero movies. <laughs> You're dead to me. And I'm sorry <laughs> to say that, but I do think that you said something interesting, like, if you keep going back to what you liked as a kid, that's kind of probably what I'm doing, and I never really liked the, because the, the, that classical heroic character or figure, whether it's in mythology or in comic books, it's, that person is too perfect. Mm -hmm. The antihero is much more grounded in yeah. our own messy lives, and they have they make mistakes and they do things that mm -hmm. you know you have the possibility to redeem yourself if you're an antihero because mm -hmm. you're flawed. That's what I and find I think attractive that, about Black Mirror. Most people are like that in Black Mirror too. Yeah. yeah. And when you were talking about you know the question about mortality and what does that do? I mean. I think that like the Greeks and their whole conception of that in, you know, in the mythology that we study today is like time doesn't mean anything to the gods. That's why Zeus is running around you know, having sex with everybody and taking the forms of different animals. And there's no, there's, that's like another form of chaos. And the fact that you are limited, and I tell my Comp 2 students this all the time, right? The fact that you're going to die your mortality means that your time is more meaningful and you need to do something with it. So I kind of like the anti-hero. I like the guy who's the flaw. I, I don't get into the superheroes. Um, um, and uh, that's... Uh, we still, we still like you. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good place. So thank you to Wesley, Tim, Chris, mm -hmm. and Lisa. Mm -hmm. thank you.